Uh, we first have Neil Sundaresan from uh, eBay, who is the senior director and also the head of their research labs. Uh, Neil's interests include social networking and analysis and applying them. In particular, he wants to apply community computing, which is what he's going to talk to us about in some detail, to finding, classification, trust, safety, reputation, incentive systems, and all other aspects of e-commerce. Prior to eBay, he was a founder and CTO of a startup uh, focused on multi-attribute fuzzy search and network CRM, customer relationship management. And before that, he was head of the Emerging Internet Technologies Group at IBM Research, where he actually built the first XML-based search engine. Uh, he has also worked on compilers, program translators, uh, runtime systems for massively parallel machines. I know many of you here are interested in that. Uh, he has a master's in computer science from IIT Bombay and a PhD from uh, Indiana Bloomington. Uh, please welcome Neil Sundari. Okay, thanks everyone for coming so early in the morning. At least it's for me, um, uh, coming from the West Coast. Uh, thanks, Ravi and uh, Johannes, for hosting us. Uh, it's a great opportunity to come and talk to people at the university about um, uh, challenges we have. And I would say whenever I say challenges, um, uh, follow it up with the word opportunity. So when you have challenges in the business, there's always opportunities. And that's what we are looking for here. So. Um, I, I run the research labs, as, as uh, Ravi pointed out, and um, we are kind of a research labs with a difference. Um, we are closely as, uh, aligned with the business um, in the company and uh, solving their problems while we manage to do our research. So that's kind of the approach we take. So, um, let me start with something that, uh, because I'm starting at a, uh, talking at a university, and you talk about um, hiring at a university. So I don't know how many of you have seen this. Um, let me try to get to that real page here. So this is the ultimate rejection letter. Uh, has anybody seen this letter before? <clears throat> so this was a rejection letter sent to Professor Millington, hopefully he's not here, um, from uh, somebody who had rejected. So thank you for your letter of March 16. After careful consideration, I re uh, regret to inform you that I'm unable to accept the refusal to offer me an assistant professor position at your department. <clears throat> This year, I've been particularly fortunate in receiving an unusually large number of rejection letters. With such a varied and promising field of candidates, it's impossible for me to accept all the refusals. <laughs> and goes on to say, despite Whitson's outstanding qualifications and previous experience in rejecting applicants, I find your rejection does not meet my needs at this time. Therefore, I'll assume the position of assistant professor in your department in August. I look forward to seeing you then. Best, best of luck rejecting future applicants. So um, what has it got to do with my talk? Um, let me show you a couple of other sites. So this is another site where um, <clears throat> it's a Brazilian artist site where they show countries' flags, and they look at the colors in the flag and um, provide some statistics related to those colors. So if you take Angola, for example, the, the red part, which is about half of the flag, is the number of people in Angola inject, uh, uh, infected with HIV. The black part is uh, mostly the other half, which is infected with malaria. And the yellow part is people with access to medical care. Right? Um, if you look at Brazil, the green part is where, um, which is most, most of the flag, uh, the Brazilian flag, um, is the percentage of people living with uh, 10, uh, less than $10 a month. And the yellow part is where less than uh, hundred dollars a month, and the blue part is less than thousand dollars a month, and the white dots, if you see it from far behind there, is a part that actually lives with more than hundred thousand dollars a month. So this is another interesting site, and so on. They got pretty much for every country. Um, so I'm not using my machine, so it's kind of a little tricky. <clears throat> 
Um, this is the third side. I'm going to go to this side. Uh, I still haven't got to my talk yet. So this is a site where I can actually do something fun. If I can get the thing started. OK, it doesn't have a flash, so I can't show this. Uh, never mind. So the point of this was um, that you know, usually um, when you go on the internet, you, don't, you go looking for stuff. But at the same time, I never, I never went looking for the site of the rejection letter or the site which had the flags and stuff like that. And that that's, uh, defines the uh, person coming to a site like eBay. They never come um, looking for, they come looking for something, but at the same time, they never look at stuff that they come looking for. So one of the things that um, Ravi pointed out that we are a search company, or at the same uh, meaning, we actually have a large search engine that powers our system. But our search engine has a different challenge. Our search engine uh, has the challenge of relevance, as um, other companies like Google and Yahoo have. But our challenge is to actually combine relevance with something what we call uh, as serendipity. So how do we show some things that are relevant at the same time making the site serendipitous, right? Uh, people come looking for something, so, and not necessarily buy or not necessarily bid on stuff that they come looking for. And many times they come looking for stuff that they don't even know they are looking for, right? So that's a complication. So this is one of the biggest challenges for us is to quantify and characterize serendipity and provide a mechanism for people to have a serendipitous experience on the site. So I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff um, that's related to this topic in the, uh, in, the, in the next few minutes. Okay, so for those of you who, uh, um, <clears throat> who know about eBay but uh, have never traded, I just want to tell a little story. So what is eBay? eBay is a marketplace um, where buyers and sellers come together. And um, so the buyers are people coming, looking for stuff, or not necessarily looking for stuff, but at the same time buying stuff. And what they want is basically a great opportunity to uh, pick up something. And that opportunity is um, uh, surfaced on the site as auctions or as fixed price items. And about 50% of the items are auction items, and about 50% of the items are fixed price items. And auctions are exciting because it gives you um, um, a notion of being participating in a game. and um, you know, winning and losing is a part of that game. And at some point, it may or may not matter what you actually bought. The fact that you won is, is an interesting thing, right? Um, for, for our sellers, I mean, it's, it's a different kind of game for them. Um, they actually are buyers from somewhere else, and they have an opportunity to merchandise their stuff on the site and put it up on the site. They pay a listing fee for, for a good part of it. And when they give, the, uh, um, uh, uh, give us the listing fee, we will give them an opportunity to merchandise their wherever they want. Now, so that's kind of the nature of the actors here. It's the buyers and the sellers. Now, there is, there's, a <coughs> there's a chemistry that happens between the buyers and the sellers um, because the sellers are trying to best merchandise their products and the buyers are trying to find the best value for the, for the stuff that they are looking for or they might find. Now, there's also a, a strong correlation between what happens on the site and what happens elsewhere, right? So, for example, um, around June 9th or 10th, um, we, we all often look at the query logs on the site, and we found that there was a huge jump in the, uh, for the query uh, George Bush. And actually, there was a big jump for the query George Bush and um, uh, wristwatch. Does anybody know why that could have been the case? Potentially, yeah. So George Bush was in Angola, and he was with the villagers there, and he was shaking hands uh, with the people there. And um, uh, there was a rumor that uh, his watch was not seen after 10 minutes of shaking hands. Um, and there was a further rumor that it might actually have shown up on eBay. <clears throat> and later on, White House issued a statement saying uh, that was not the case. Uh, Bush was smart enough to put his watch in his pocket before he shook hands with people. Um, so <clears throat> just when that happened, uh, people, um, the search on eBay significantly uh, for George Bush jumped up. And, uh, within a matter of a few hours. And within a matter of days, actually, our sellers selling anything that's related to George Bush started uh, saying watch somewhere. So this is George Bush wearing a watch. Or this watch looks like George Bush's watch. Right? And you can call it spam, but at the same time, you can also uh, call it clever marketing. Right? 
Um, so for a search engine like eBay, it's a huge challenge. When somebody says something like that, and somebody doesn't come looking for George Bush's watch, or does come looking for George Bush's watch, how do you match up what people are listing and what people are actually looking for and buying? Right? So that's, that's one of our biggest challenges. And there's always this uh, strong correlation between what happens on, offline and what happens online. Our prospective buyers and our prospective sellers pick them up at different points of time and use them to find value or use them to find or, or, or merchandise their item very, very well. Okay, so that's the nature of, nature of our business. So I'm going to go give you a little bit of statistics because these are mandatory slides that you show whenever you go out and give a talk. And this is a bunch of old slides, but at the same time, this will be, give you some perspective on uh, what the business is about. So a car sells every two minutes. A pattern accessory sells every three seconds. A diamond jewelry sells every 83 seconds. And um, a shoe sells every 10 minutes. And a baseball card sells every six seconds. And if you look at the listings, this is an old graph. And this is, this is how listings grow on the site. I mean, there are about half a billion listings, and this is back from 2005. It's much more right now. Um, no, but at the same time, it tells you the, the, the volume of data you're dealing with or the, the, the uh, nature, nature of um, uh, how the search has to be done. And for our search engine, uh, primarily, uh, our search engine, by the way, is a homegrown engine, um, mainly because when somebody lists an item on the site, it has to almost immediately show up, modulo all the security constraints we have uh, show up on the site. So if you're a seller, you, uh, you have something to sell, you go into the um, uh, um, uh, listing flow and list your item, and what do you do? Immediately you come back and search on the site and say if my item shows up or not. You don't really wait for a day or two to say my item will show up after two days. If it doesn't show up, you think you did something wrong when you listed your item and you go back and try to relist it or whatever. So the biggest challenge for us is to actually make a real-time um, uh, re uh, real rendition of the item that is being listed on the site. And as the number of listings grow, um, making such a real-time uh, experience for our users uh, is, is a big challenge for us. So I can take questions on that um, in, uh, at, at some point. Okay. Now, the other big challenge for us is that our buyers are, and the, the disconnect between our buyers and sellers. Um, I, I've been harping about it from the beginning. It's like our buyers come uh, looking for or not looking for something, and our sellers are trying to sell something, and we provide the mechanism in between for our sellers to list their item. And as, as this happens, um, uh, there's a lot of, lot of uh, challenges related to that. Okay, so let's talk about the buying challenge to start with. And um, when, we, when we look at our buyers, and based upon the queries, based upon the, um, uh, based upon the user visits we do, um, based upon um, the other statistics that we run on the site, on the site or um, other research we get from outside, um, we try and classify our buyers into uh, various buckets. And I'll give you some examples of what our buyers look like. So uh, to identify the finding challenge, we have buyers who we qualify as people who exactly know what they're looking for. Right? They, um, they know what they're looking for, they come look for it, they, they, they pick up the item and they go away. Then we have guys who actually, people who have the right tools to look for it. So these are the guys who, um, the, who are experts in that area, they have the right tools to look for these things. And they come in, and um, they, they look for spelling, uh, spelling mistakes, and they look for other stuff, and they actually find the item more effectively than some other people because they have the right tools to work. And there are other people who actually come, and they don't, know, um, they don't know how the site works, but at the same time, they work really, really hard. So if you look at the query logs, I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Um, they work really hard at finding the thing that they want to find. You know, they do advanced search. They, they actually go and refine your query. They, they check for possible uh, corrections. And they, go ca they do category browse. And eventually, for, they find the right. So there are, these are some of the three categories. But the biggest category is this. Right? People really don't know what they're looking for. So if you look at our top queries, if you, if you look at our typical queries, uh, people come and look for stuff, but at the same time, you know, the, the item they're looking for or might be looking for might be right there, but at the same time, they land up bidding or buying something else. So this is our, I mean, this is, this is a typically a prospective buyer, and we need to make the site interesting for these kinds of buyers. So again, I'll, I'll reiterate that relevance is an interesting problem for us. It is important because when somebody searches, things have to be relevant. But at the same time, along with relevance, uh, the, niche, um, uh, the notion of serendipity is equally important. Okay. So, and um, I'll give you some examples here of, uh, of one of the sellers. I'm not, not sure if you can read it. But this is somebody coming and looking for Webkins. 
And um, what I have here is a query cloud of uh, Webkins queries. So if you look here, there's a, a Black Lab Webkins and Bunny Webkins and um, uh, Webkins Sherbet Bunny and so on and so forth. And if I, uh, so the, the biggest query is actually Bunny Webkins here. So if I go, dig one level deeper and look for Bunny Webkins, what are the queries that are related to Bunny Webkins? Here's what I see. Actually, um, so there's a Sherbet Bunny Webkins and then um, the, the user is trying to uh, permute those queries. So you've got Sherbet Bunny Webkins and then somewhere here Sherbet Bunny Webkins uh, in the reverse order. And then uh, people are not sure whether it's spelled, uh, Shepard is spelled with an R or without an R. And, but equal number of people actually um, uh, search for both, both, both combinations of queries here. So the S-H-E-R-B-E-R-T and S-H-E-R-B-E-T, both, both get used. And uh, if you look at somewhere here, uh, you, uh, somewhere here there's a reasonable number of people actually use both the, both, both the uh, words in their title to look for stuff. Now, this tells you something. Um, if you, if you look at how, how search engines work, uh, if it was an R query, um, you know, this query over here, which basically says Webkins, Sherbert, Sherbert, Bunny, would qualify. But if it is an AND query, it will not show either of these items because neither of these, n n none of the items uh, have both of these words, assuming that the sellers have not used both these spellings. But at the same time, the sellers know what buyers come looking for, so they might use the limited real estate they have to put in both the words because so, you know, you are trying to judge what the other person is, uh, might come looking for on the side. So you might say, well, uh, how the people can't spell Britney Spears? So let me use all possible spellings for Britney Spears. Um, and the buyers might say, uh, how the sellers can't uh, sell what, how Britney Spears is uh, spelled? So they'll come and look for all permutations of spelling. But at the same time, they may not know this middle person that's, that's eBay in between, which, uh, which does this indexing and, and um, uh, managing the search for you. Uh, does it do any spelling corrections? What kind of spelling corrections that, uh, get done? And uh, what, 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 do this, uh, what do this query relevance mean? Is it an AND or an OR query, or is it something else kind of stuff, right? <clears throat> so that's, that's one of the big challenges for us. So I'm going to give you another example here of uh, uh, some of the related queries that people do. So here's a um, query for Mustang, and um, here are the related queries to Mustang. So, um, so these relationships here are mostly related to uh, mostly using qu queries done in the same session. So um, with, with some, some, some uh, algorithms uh, tying, uh, tied underneath. So you've got Mustang and Transam and Corvette and Shelby, right? Now I've got uh, additional relationship, which is um, what, what, what words or what terms were typed along with the term Mustang uh, or Corvette or Transam. And, Typically, they are years of cars, so 1970, 1967, 1965, 1969. And the, the thickness of the lines here um, tell you how strongly correlated these are. So if you look at Corvette, people coming looking for Corvettes are mostly looking for 67 and 69 Corvettes, and mostly for 67 Corvettes, whereas people looking for Mustang come looking mostly for 65 Mustangs and less for uh, 69 or 70 Mustangs. So this is... This is kind of something that you actually learn when you look at the queries on the side. Let me show you something else. Um, uh, Jessica Simpson, and people coming looking for Jessica Simpson, uh, what do they do uh, in related sessions when they come looking for? Um, um, these are strong correlations between Jessica Simpson and other, um, uh, other um, I guess, music stars, or whatever you call them. Um, in the same session or related sessions. So you've got Britney Spears and Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan and so on and so forth. And, um, but then you also see that um, people look for Rocket Dog and Rainbow Bright when they look for Jessica Simpson. Um, does anybody, can anybody guess why Rocket Dog um, gets typed with Jessica Simpson in the same session? So, um, so far my assumption is that um, at least the left part of this graph are people who uh, produce music. So let's expand some of these queries and see what actually people look for. Most people come looking for, especially with uh, the bottom two artists here, Jessica Alba and Christina Aguilera, come looking for posters. And uh, uh, with some of them, they actually come looking for photos. Now, posters and photos are different things. Photos are, you know, some paparazzi going to some beach somewhere and finding these people and taking pictures of them, and, or at least claiming to have taken the picture of them. And, and posting on the site. Posters are something that is official, that are signed posters and stuff like that. And they sell for different prices and they're, they're different, they, they cater to different audiences on the site. But if you look at Britney Spears, 
Um, there's a very strong correlation with different spheres in here. Can anybody guess why that would be the case? What's that? Yeah. So uh, a few months ago, she shaved her hair, and um, her hair apparently showed up on eBay. Um, <coughs> I, I, I can't, I can't uh, validate this, but, um, but that, was, that was when that happened. But later on, now people who actually sell posters and photos and some other stuff related to Britney Spears, um, say Britney Spears with long hair, Britney Spears with dyed hair, Britney Spears with, um, um, you know, so on. And they're all true. They're all true statements, right? Because there's a poster, she's a woman, she's got hair, and um, uh, it's just that it's less important that she's a celebrity and more important that she's got hair, right? Uh, <clears throat> and if you look at uh, some of these other ones, like Jessica Simpson and Rocket Dog, um, it turns out to be um, uh, Rocket Dog is a band of shoes, and Jessica Simpson there's a shoes brand um, with Jessica Simpson's name on it. And people come looking for shoes with Jessica Simpson on it. And that's why people who come looking for shoes try these two terms about in the same session, which is, which is really surprising for us. And uh, same with Paris Hilton and Jessica Simpson is perfume. Now, the interesting part of this graph is that nobody actually comes looking for music from these people. Uh, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> so that. You would have, you know, so when we merchandise on the side, when we build merchandising algorithms on the side, um, if we were to show people CDs or, or music that's related to the same genre, probably won't, they wouldn't get any click-throughs, uh, mainly because people don't come, in, come looking for that. People come looking for something else, but that have the names of these people attached to it. So that's, that's an interesting revelation to us. And so when we build our merchandising algorithms, or, or when I say serendipity, I mean, it's serendipity to the person coming and looking for stuff, but at the same time, it's programmed serendipity, right? So how do we program serendipity into your system so that you can, uh, you can, get, the, uh, you can get people coming into the site surprised and interested and create stickiness, right? So how do you, how do you incorporate that into that thing? So uh, we, did, we did a bunch of other stuff. I'll just give you one example here. We took uh, all the top queries in, um, uh, on the site uh, during a certain period of time and looked at them and say, hey, how specific and how, how generic they are. And it turns out that most of the queries are fairly generic. And so here's one example. Um, this uh, coins is a top query. Coins, uh, so there's eBay uh, coins is a top selling category. And co people come and type in coins, and then they just wander off on the site. And uh, there's also a strong correlation, which I don't show here, is um, people who come looking for coins actually do land up buying something on the side. So I don't have details on what they buy on the side, but something that might be related to coins or not. So uh, we tried out another interface, which is basically saying, oh, when people type in coins, how do I take out the results? We just type in coins on eBay. Probably, you'll probably get tens of thousands of results. And how do you find the right kind of coin they're looking for? And obviously, when somebody types in coin on the site, they don't really come looking for any coin. Right? They just want to know what, what does the site have that is related to coins. And then figure out, refine, uh, wander around. So if they get to see something interesting on the site, they will actually land up participating in that auction. Right? So one of the ways we, uh, we uh, showed this off, again, this isn't a prototype system. This is not, this is not uh, live on site, is, uh, is to cluster, obviously. Right? So when, when somebody types in coin, we can actually say cluster these results basically uh, by saying, OK, historical coins of the United States, one cent coins, and bullion coins, and uh, silver coins and gold coins and coin stubs and so on. As you see, there, these are not manually hand categorized. These are dynamically clustered as the queries come in. Again, um, I'll talk about um, what, is, what is used to do some of this clustering, but the idea here is that um, we, in eBay, you have categories uh, where items go into, and, um, but again, uh, not all I items can go into single categories, and not all items go into the categories that they should belong to are not all items can belong to the categories that, that they go into. So we need to, so category is just an approximation of where things belong. So we can't reuse, we can show a category browse, but that solves only part of your problem. But there are other things. Um, there, are, uh, there are things like the price of the item. So when I come looking for a coin, am I looking for a 25 cent coin or am I looking for a $2,000 coin, right? So some of this other aspect. And bucketing things, it, getting into the user's mind as to how, how much this user might be willing to spend on the site and bucket them accordingly is, is, uh, is another way of clustering. So what this shows here is basically combining some of these aspects and providing uh, a, a navigation into the site for somebody who just types coin on the site.
to get them to the uh, get them to act, participate um, in an activity on the site. So not necessarily get to the item they are looking for, but get to a point where they can actually participate in in, in an activity on the site. Okay. And feel free to stop me and ask questions. Um, Ravi said I have only five hours. So, so our early search engine, the way it worked was, um, it was based on standard IR relevance. Um, so you type in a word, we look at all the terms in the title, and you basically order them uh, according to some um, um, uh, standard, standard IR relevance, right? And um, so our sellers get clever. They put in uh, terms in the titles. So if you're looking for an iPod Nano, um, uh, people will say iPod Nano Black 4 gig, um, um, uh, uh, new um, skin. So when you type in iPod Nano, um, are you c uh, coming and looking for a um, player or are you come looking for a skin? And we have bo got both kinds of users. One sells for $200, or so that sells for $1.99. Right? So uh, and when you type in iPod Nano, we have no idea what you, what you come looking for on the site. And so we need to understand, try and understand what you might be actually looking for. And depending upon what you're looking for, uh, we need to show the appropriate item. And again, these are, this, is, this is actually just a guess as to what you might be looking for. We also have a contract with our sellers. So we need to represent their items. When somebody types in iPod Nano, the item has to show up because it's, it's related to the query iPod Nano. And we give them about seven or eight words uh, on the title to, uh, which, which gets indexed to best represent their items. So um, the term iPod Nano is fairly closely related to an iPod Nano skin, but at the same time, when somebody types in iPod Nano, are they looking for a skin or a player? Is it so there is this disconnect again between the buyer and the seller, or prospective buyer and the, and the prospective seller. So, and this is what we call as desirability. And desirability is basically what our sellers want to sell and what our buyers might want, uh, might be looking for. And how do we compute this? And how do we bridge this gap between what the sellers want to sell and what the buyers want to buy? And we, we compute this index as a desirability index. I'll talk a little bit about this. And um, when you, once you compute the desirability index, you're basically getting the seller closer to the buyer. So this can be again used for um, various things, like showing ads on the site, or m merchandising, or for actually basic relevance. So can you, can you improve your relevance based upon the desirability index that you might compute based upon what people are doing on the site? Now again, the problem is that uh, you, if you want to compute desirability in uh, real time, you know, only after you get the demand, you know what the desirability is, by which time it's too late for you to actually compute it and use it on the site. So what we do is that we compute desirability offline. So we compute desirability uh, based upon past events. So at, um, um, at some time t, we basically say desirability is basically the differential between demand and supply. And <clears throat> we compute this and we index it on the site. And then we say, okay, at, at a later time, which is time t plus k, when uh, there is a demand, we can look at the supply at that point of time, and we take the desirability at the, that was computed at time t and um, uh, augment that to, that to do relevance. So this is, uh, um, um, this is something that we've done. Now, there are some challenges with this. So what is t and what is t plus k? How often do you index it? Um, uh, can you do it once in three months? Can you, uh, do you need to do it once every day? I mean, there's a cost to doing it uh, more frequently because I mean, these indices are large. and um, uh, there's a, uh, we need to get creative by uh, incrementally indexing and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, um, if you do it um, um, uh, too infrequently or if you do it um, um, slower than um, uh, how the market is changing, then you actually confuse the users. I'll give you one simple example here. Um, uh, let's say somebody types in MP3 players, right? So um, when they type in MP3 player, maybe... Uh, Four, four, three, four years ago, they might have been looking for a certain kind of MP3 player, right? Um, three years ago, they were looking for an iPod, uh, and whatever the, whatever the uh, iPod at that time was, was a mini, maybe, iPod mini. Uh, two years ago, maybe they were uh, looking for an iPod shuffle. You know, a year ago, maybe they were looking for an iPod Nano, right? So when you go, for, uh, so if, you're, if your desirability is computed at, um, uh, is too stale, you might actually recommend the wrong kind of products, uh, wrong kind of items. Um, you, you don't want to, if, if somebody comes and types in an MP3 player, you might want to push them to something like an iPod Nano uh, phone or uh, iPod phone or uh, uh, anything that's, that's uh, most popular today or, or more relevant today than that was relevant two years ago. 
And so that's why we, uh, we have to get really creative with how we compute the desirability index. Now, this is actually live on site today, so um, I'm not going to show you a demo. Um, if you go, by, go to eBay and you do a search, and if you look at default search, it will, um, uh, it will show you the standard relevance, but then there's a drop down on the right hand side which has a bunch of things like time ending soon, um, um, uh, lowest price to high price, and high price to low price, and there's one called best match, and best match is the one that uses this desirability index uh, to, to uh, compute new relevance. So how do we compute it? We basically look at user page views, click-throughs, bid-throughs, and past purchases uh, when somebody types in a query term. So when you have a query term, uh, iPod, Nano, or, uh, or coins, we basically say, what happened? What did they do on the site? What did they tend to click on, and what did they tend not to click on? What did they tend to bid on, and what did they tend not to bid on? And uh, t take, the, t take those items or those products, and the information contained in there saying, hey, what are, what are they giving a thumbs up on? What are they giving thumbs down on? and compute a desirability index based upon that. And things that they don't click on probably means there's, na um, and there's a dampening there. Now even here there are a lot of interesting things, right? Suppose you show something, how do you, how do you cold start such a system? When you show something on page four, it might be the standard, uh, standard relevance. But if the user took the pain to go to page four and click on an item, that means they are, uh, they're giving a bigger thumbs up to that item than when you showed it and it appeared as the first item on the, uh, on the results side, right? So there are, there are ways attached to where, where, the, where the item shows up and um, how, how much pain the user took to actually uh, 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 click on that item or bid or buy that item. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions on this? Okay. So that's, that's kind of the um, buying challenge or finding challenge that we have, and we have to constantly combine relevance with, with, the, with the notion of serendipity, which is surfaced through, uh, combined with re uh, relevance and, and with merchandising on the side. Now, um, I should say one thing about, uh, about relevance, which is, um, you know, we can't, we can't just say relevance is 100% uh, important because um, we re everything, is to uh, everything we find out, we find out through a certain, percent uh, certain confidence. So we can't really be showing the most relevant thing on top and expecting the user to behave a certain way. And secondly, we can't ignore the people who use those terms because most of the people didn't buy their items. I mean, items don't sell for various reasons. Items don't sell because they're poorly priced, because there's not much trust involved, um, not, not much trust associated with the seller trying to sell the item. And buyers are, buyers are you know, uh, smart in the sense that um, they look, I mean, each one is different, right? So somebody comes looking for a reputed seller, and somebody comes looking for a seller who just uh, poorly spelled the item and uh, doesn't have much reputation but gives a better price. So, for, for all of us, um, for each one of us, the relevance means something else, right? So we can't, we, we can't make um, uh, pure relevance 100%, right? It has to be combined with other things that are existing on this side. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's look at the selling challenge. So as, uh, this is how our, our sellers would like to sell, right? Um, they, they would like to organize their products in the best possible way and um, you know, merchandise their products really, really well. And they can take, um, some, um, follow some disciplines, like they can say, okay, I, I need to put things in categories, so I'll put in categories, I know what, where things start and where things end, I can put things in categories, so I can do that. But they would also like to do this, right? They would like to uh, create a notion where, uh, where people are surprised, so they want to put things in a place where people don't expect it, and actually better sell their wear. So we provide them tools on the site to actually do this. So the, uh, if, if anybody has ever been a seller on eBay, uh, there's this notion called um, uh, sell a list in two categories. We actually charge for it. Um, so you can take your uh, um, uh, iPod, or, or let's say you, you, you can take your Hawaiian shirt and list in the um, uh, shirts category, or you can also list in something ethnic Hawaiian category. So we allow you to do that stuff. And it, it, it's, it's fair in the sense that uh, you don't know uh, which one is correct. You just have reasonable confidence that it is co correct in either of these two categories. Now, um, so, but at the same time, they, the sellers are very creative, and they constantly tell us that we want to do something like this. And what do we make them do? We make them do something like this. So if you look at the eBay category structure, we have, we have about seven levels of categories and about 60,000 leaf level categories. So... <clears throat> And th this is really, really hard for some of these people. I mean, th many of these people don't have college education, um, but at the same time, they are great business people, right? They, don't, they, don't, they, they may not have an academic degree, but at the same time, they're great at their business. They're selling out of their garage. 
Um, and many of these items are items that are, um, that are uh, they, they think are unique, right? So making them bucket into this deep category structure is actually, you know, um, um, uh, it's not, not exactly the right thing to do. But at the same time, that's how the site evolves. If you go back 10 years, we had few categories that was manageable, but as the site grew as a kind of item that's s sold on the sites, uh, things got more and more complex, right? So, and uh, we don't really have catalogs for everything. And it's, it's, it's really not even possible to have catalogs for everything. Um, there was a book called The Long Tail, which is, a, which is a very well written book by Chris Anderson. And he was at eBay giving a talk and saying, uh, I think he hired some MBA students to do some research on um, long tail in the very company. For the most part, the book is very interesting. Um, it doesn't talk much about eBay, so I, I, I met him after this talk and I said, uh, how come you don't have any conclusive results on eBay? And he said, yeah, because you don't have catalogs. And I said, you have a book um, which is title is The Long Tail, and how do you expect catalogs to exist in the long tail? And he said, no, yeah, but you've been selling things for over 10 years, and you should have a catalog. So he's partially correct. We should have catalogs, but we can't have catalogs for everything. And for the most part, we can't really have catalogs. Because things, I mean, you can, you can uh, combine structures and put, in, put them into buckets and create attributes and values. But generally, you cannot, in that structure, extract the colorful nature of these items. And so that's, that's our cataloging challenge. So we can't really, uh, you know, uh, make things um, uh, in, in, put, put into buckets of catalog rows and say this is what it is. Because it, it is what it is for who is selling. I mean, it is different for depending upon who is selling it and who is buying it. And a lot of things sell for a higher price because they have a great story attached to them. And you can't really catalog great story. Right? So that's, that's one of our big challenges. For example, right? so you look at this thing. So that's a pretzel, right? Um, for somebody, it's a pretzel. For somebody else, it's actually a mother with a baby in her arm. Right? So if you have a great story attached to that pretzel, you can actually sell it. it it's a difference between a, a 20 cent item and a $2,000 item. Right? Um, I don't know how many of you have followed this story. Right? <clears throat> uh, uh, if you don't know the story, a couple of years ago, what do you see? It's a cheese sandwich. Uh, if you look hard, there is um, Virgin Mary there. Um, uh, somebody had a cheese sandwich uh, frozen in their fridge for, I guess, 10 years or something and they listed it on eBay. Um, the items eventually sold for $67,000. Now, did people come looking for a cheese sandwich? No. Did people come looking for Virgin Mary? Probably, maybe, we don't know. Uh, was any advertising done related to this item on the site? Uh, no. But how did people find it, and how did people eventually bid it up so that it could sell for the price it could sell for? And what is the value of this item? Is it the, is it the fact that it is religious, or is it the fact that it is a great cheese sandwich? Or is it something else, right? And uh, does anybody know why? Who bought them? Who bought it? So it, what's that? It was, it was bought by some company in Las Vegas. It was a great marketing vehicle for them, right? They bought it, and they got covered in New York Times, and they got covered in the Wall Street Journal. They got covered everywhere. And the story gets told over and over and over again. And it is the cheapest marketing campaign they ever ran uh, for $67,000, right? So, um, the, the, the point there is, you know, uh, wh what it is and what it actually turns out to be is, 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 is a very different thing. I mean, we have stories of somebody who bought a broken um, uh, camera from 50 years ago for $4 and sold it for $2,000. Um, so one is knowing the value of the items, and another is attaching a great story to it and actually telling that story. So the, the point here is basically we have a really long tail. And when we have a really long tail, for us, um, um, it, it's a long and colorful tail, and for us, it, cataloging, categorizing items is a real challenge. Now, this combines um, the, the problem of finding, the problem of searching and relevance, the problem of listing and categorizing these items, and also the problem of um, uh, differentiating between spam or fraud on the site to, to relevance. So they go hand in hand on the site. So what we used to do before, we used to have so-called category managers. Um, category managers were um, uh, well-paid MBAs who, who owned categories on the site. So there would be a category manager for sports memorabilia. There would be a category manager for um, uh, coins. There would be another category manager for uh, electronics. And they would organize things in that category. So things would come, and they would put things in categories. And they would look at these categories, and they would say, um, 
okay, this category has it's got too much noise on it, so I'm going to separate it out to two, two categories, or I'm going to create some new attributes in these categories. And this was done by a human being, and they are like the um, um, uh, the monarchs of the, their categories, and they were very passionate about the categories. There are categories where the category managers ran that category for five years, and you wonder what do you teach them in the MBA program that makes them like that, right? But at the same time, they were very passionate about their categories to a point where things became so large and so big on the site, which was just a year ago, that um, the, um, they, can, they could not manage it anymore. So what the category manager thinks should be a breakdown of iPod, uh, even, even something as clear as iPod uh, or electronics, it should break it down a certain way, is different from what the buyers and what the sellers think they should be broken down as. Now that's for very well-defined categories like electronics, but go to these long tail items like coins and shirts and toys. It gets very different there. So we, we, we did a huge uh, uh, campaign inside the company to say, well, this is not going to scale. And this, it was not scaling. Uh, we can only hire so many highly paid MBAs in the company to, to manage categories. And also, the, uh, our measurement showed that there was uh, less correlation between what people come looking for and what people sell on the site to how they're categorized on the site. So we said, well, we're all smart computer scientists, and we're going to use the machine to do some of this stuff. Right? So we built, built a machine on, um, um, uh, machine learning algorithm, which basically will automatically mine the data on the site and tell you where things go. Oh, this item belongs in this category with this much confidence, and this item belongs in that, some other category with a different confidence. And we um, uh, basically uh, deployed items on the site. And actually, uh, shopping.com, which is a company that eBay bought uh, a couple of years ago, or more, a little longer than that, is an expert at that. So now, uh, as computer scientists, a lot of, uh, all of you know that, uh, you know, uh, to, for these machines to work, we need to train these machines. So which means we need domain experts for these categories. So the domain experts give the machines examples of what belongs in those categories, and the machines will take those examples, and when new items get listed on the site, they actually go and put, um, put, put things in those categories. So um, uh, what shopping.com did was they hired what, uh, quote unquote, the domain experts. And to make these thing, uh, things cheaper, you know, what do you do? You hire them in India and in Ireland and other places. So they got the so-called domain experts who are, uh, who are in these different places and who actually put items in buckets. But again, given the very complex nature of the site and the category structure on the site, um, it, it worked okay to some, for some categories, but it didn't work great for, for others. And finally, we learned this is really the case. You know, finally, the machine is really stupid and we're not going to be able to scale this problem. So machine, machine learning is a good thing to do. Um, it's, a, it's a good start, but at the same time, and it's, going to, to, it's going to do what you ask it to do. Right? It's not going to correct itself. So we, we, have, we came to a new realize, realization that, um, yeah, okay, we can get rid of the category managers, we can, uh, but at the same time, even for machines uh, to do something for us, it should be doing, we need to train the system. And even training is a really, really hard problem for us in India, right? Because, because of the diverse nature of the things on the site. So we, we said, okay, let, let's do something else, something slightly different. Um, we have got this large user community. Right? We got, um, this is old data, but at the same time, we got about 200 million users on the site. Some of them are buyers and some of them are sellers. Um, and they have a lot of knowledge about the things that they buy and sell on the site. So how do we use this? and actually provide, um, um, can, can we do something with this kind of a, with the idea? And mostly, many of these guys were doing this, right? They were complaining about things that were not working. Sellers were saying, hey, why are you increasing our, our listing fee? Or uh, why is my item not showing up? Or why is you know, uh, somebody didn't pay? And most of the time, they were doing this. Now, how do we take these people and actually make them um, produce a magic flute? Right? So we, we went around this problem of um, um, uh, uh, solving it in such a way. How do you organize the community in such a way? We got this large user base in such a way that actually they can make the machine look really, really smart. Right? We started on this problem, but before we could start on, we had to do something else. Now, now this is obviously it's not a new idea. And um, um, here at CMU, um, Juan and actually started with the, the idea of games, using games to do some of these things. And how do you how do you provide incentives to people? to um, uh, use games to actually provide information that you might, actually, uh, you might actually require. And here's some really interesting statistics, like just in the last one year, about a billion and a half hours were spent um, um, by people playing Tetris. Now, if these people's um, time was actually put to some good use, we can um, 
produce something really interesting that is useful to you know, mankind. So uh, some of this comes from that idea also. Right? So we, we've built our first category classifier, which is basically standard Bayesian classifier, but that's not the interesting part here. The interesting part here is the fact how we, uh, uh, is how we train the system. Now we train the system basically by using our user community. And to start with, before, before we could tell the users how we were using them to train the community, we first looked at user behavior data. And the user behavior data comes from various shapes. So uh, how a seller lists an item on the site, which is basically the categories they list, list them under, or how buyers come and buy the items on the site, which might be actually uh, about a quarter of our users come and browse on the site and, and click on an item. So what is the nature of browse on the site and related to what items they click on? Um, we looked at also um, uh, uh, listing in the wrong category. Does it actually reduce the probability that an item will sell or not sell? And we took all of this information and provided, built an implicit system to say, hey, now we can actually train the system automatically without hiring these expensive people or hiring a lot of people, domain experts too. So our domain experts are actually our buyers and sellers. And we can use information from them, either explicitly or implicitly, to build a category structure that is actually useful for us. And this is one of the lowest hanging fruits for us because category is not a big deal, right? Category is just things, uh, structures into which things go. Um, there's a lot more to finding on the site than, uh, than just a category. But we also know that categories are one of the strongest indicators of various things in the site. For example, um, and things, things get miscategorized for various reasons. One is, uh, again, the category structure was not good enough for the seller, as I said before. The other thing is, uh, it, it's, the seller doesn't know where things belong. The seller believes it belongs here or here, and it, it is quite often that is the case, right? Does, uh, does the kimono doll belong in the kimono category or the doll category? We don't know, right? And the third thing is uh, fraud on the site. Uh, there is some correlation between um, miscategorizing an item and committing fraud on the site. I mean, this is an implicit information that we know, but, the, but so th this is some information that we can use to do something else on the site. So just, just because the item was miscategorized doesn't mean that it is a fraud item, right? <clears throat> but at the same time, um, there, is, there is some correlation. Now, you know, we also looked at if I, when items are miscategorized, do they, do they actually sell or do people not find or not find? And there is some correlation there also. So this, this went fairly successful. Uh, this was really successful for, uh, from, from our point of view because it cost us uh, um, nothing in, the, in terms of actually hiring people to, to train the system. We, we just gleaned the information that was already there on the site with some incentives to our community and combined that to train the system and then use the machine to actually create a class classification. Yeah. There are several kinds of fraud that happens on the site, right? I mean, or like on any site. So there is spam, which is the most simplest of the thing. And fraud is um, when you say something is a, a genuine first edition and it doesn't turn out to be so. Um, or you know, from the buyer's point of view, when you, when you buy the item and you don't send the money. Uh, from the seller's point of view, uh, um, you know, uh, fraud happens of various kind. There, there's one, one of the things is you take over somebody's account and list an item on their, uh, on their behalf. So there all kinds of things that happen. Um, so the, the, there's a strong correlation. Um, uh, all, all I meant to say here was that none of that is seen in just miscategorizing an item. Miscategorizing an item is, is just, just, just a fact. And there, if, if, that, if that is a fact, how, how is it related to some of the other things that are um, uh, not desirable on the site happening? And that's basically what we were looking at. So, I mean, uh, going to fraud, we can take it later as to what the fraud, fraud issues are. Okay. So we basically were now said, well, this is, this is really good. So we can actually use our community to do the computing for us. So we got these large machines. We were scaling every time. Every time we needed to um, uh, scale our search engine, we can add lots of servers. We can connect to the servers. We can create clusters. But at the same time, right, we were not using our community really, really well. So how do you augment? The, the intelligence of the computer to the intelligence of the, um, uh, or, or, the, or the power of the computer to, to compute things really, really fast in a scalable way to the intelligence of our users um, and combine all of the two things and, um, and produce much, you know, uh, produce, produce a situation where you actually have one plus one equals three. Because with this augmented intelligence, um, uh, we, we learned that um, actually the, the, the overall effect was much, much higher than, than we would have just got from peer, peer users or peer. Uh, peer computers. Okay. 
So um, based on this, we launched the first, uh, 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 first of the systems. So we, we launched a, an incentive system for our sellers when they list their items. So here's an example. I won't take you to the site. But this is a guy who is, uh, um, uh, this is live on site today. If you are a seller, you actually go through the flow, you might, you, you might find this flow. So somebody is trying to list a Fredbear element component bow. Uh, compound bow. So I guess it's some kind of a, a bow in the archery category. Um, I don't know this category very well, but at the same time, um, so t traditionally what what you would do is that you just list this item and 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 it'll show up on the site. But when a lot of people list it, you know, um, you, you actually know um, what are the real attributes for this for, for this bow, right? So we have behavioral data for the users. We use that to actually make some recommendation. So we say, okay, there is something called bow tie. Uh, bow type, and that's compound. There's something called brand, which is bare archery. And things that we don't find, we actually allow them to enter it. Uh, so there's something called dexterity. And some of our sellers might actually pick the term dexterity. Um, and, we, and we use that information to say whether it's left-handed or entry drawn data or whatever that is. So as, as you go on using the, using the system, the system gets smarter and smarter as it goes on. Now, one of the pieces of information that you have here is, is the amount of trust you have in the, uh, or, or, uh, the reputation of the, of the people listing the item itself. So, so somebody who actually sells a lot in the, in the, in the uh, archery category um, knows the category very well, knows the item very well. And they, if they are high, high reputation people, then actually what they provide as information is a lot more useful to the system than you know, somebody else doing that. So you can use this weighted information to make recommendations. Um, so we built the system, and it actually is working fairly well. So all of a sudden, we didn't have to do stuff that um, we were doing before in terms of, uh, again, creating catalogs or, or um, uh, using category managers to create this information. The community is actually creating the information for us, which is, uh, which is a great thing. And now we can combine that with the learning system that ha happens under the cover to whether to trust something that somebody says or not trust that somebody says and, and uh, surface it on the site. Now, again, uh, I have to have a caveat here, which is basically when seller says something on the site, it has to show up on the site. So if a seller picks a particular attribute and if the machine believes that it is not, it is not a fair attribute or a value, we still have to show it because that's a contract with the seller. Now, how you use it in the site to, to, uh, to, to, for relevance or for other purposes is a whole different, uh, whole different thing. So this is, this is the beginning of social, uh, social computing for us, or community computing for us. And we started looking uh, a lot more at uh, commerce from the social point of view, uh, starting with this. So we were looking at, um, you know, especially if you go to the uh, categories like uh, collectibles, uh, we have this uh, um, uh, notion called compare and compete, or compete and compare, where our sellers and buyers are always competing with each other because our buyers want the best deal and the sellers want the best price, right? But at the same time, there is this notion of community where they help each other out. So while competing with each other, they help each other out. And when they win against somebody else, they actually like to show it off, right? So they like to say, hey, I want this over you, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's and there, there are unique ways of doing it, right? So, so there, there is this pride that exists in, this, in these categories or in, this, in, or in these domains where uh, uh, people buying and people selling or people winning auctions actually like to show off. People winning auctions or people who know v very well about the category or even act like category polices where they help out other people to, to uh, bid or buy on these items. Right? So we, we started with this and we started looking at some of these categories and we basically said, well, what do we do with this? Now, um, we need trust on the site. Right? So how do we use the community to create this trust structure on the site? Right? And, but at the same time, we need to provide safety. Right? So we, we separate our trust and safety very, very clearly. Now, for, for um, I mean, there's a question about fraud. Um, fraud is something that falls under the safety category. Um, and from com coming from our point of view, how, uh, you know, trust is a lot more important than safety. So for example, um, you know, if, you, if you were to improve the number of good users on any site, um, you don't have to worry so much about the bad users. The percentage of good users automatically goes up, which means you can say, hey, fraud has gone, up, gone down on the site. So uh, the difference between trust and safety is basically, you know, do you install street lights or do you hire more cops, right? And quite often, street lights are cheaper to install on the streets than actually hire more cops, right? So one is a trust issue where people, can, uh, people feel that they can saf safely walk the streets, um, and the other is actually um, uh, cops catching the thieves, right? And we always juggle between these two issues. Um, 
uh, if you go back 10 years, again, there were, there were um, and in trust and safety, we, we have a group in eBay which, which uh, uh, runs a lot of this stuff. It was less of an issue because actually um, it, the site was small enough that the community provided an environment, created an environment for trust, and we had to do less with, uh, less with safety at that point. I mean, things have changed over the last 10 years, but we are going back to the system saying, hey, we can only create so many rules for safety. We can only create so many rules in a system where you can say this is a fraud, this is not a fraud. I mean, this is a fraud item that, goes, that has to go through a separate checkpoint uh, before it, get, it gets on the site. Or this is a, uh, possibly a fraud item, so this particular fraudulent seller, so this seller has to go through a, a certain other path before they can actually sell their item. Now, we can only do so much of that because, as you know, fraudsters play, you know, um, uh, games to the system, they get, uh, they're always one step above, above what you are about the system, right? So we have something very simple on eBay, which, which is, again, our tradition, which is our feedback system, right? So we got positive feedback, and we got negative feedback, right? And, you know, if you, and that is a great thing, again, and so if you go back 10 years, um, the idea was that anybody could leave feedback on anybody. So it was actually the most, most uh, well-known social commerce site that existed then, even though it, the, the idea of social commerce are not, was not sold that. Uh, it's hot today, right now, 10 years ago. So uh, I buy something from Thomas, and somebody else could come and say, hey, um, he's a bad seller or he's a good seller. And that worked okay for the site. But as the site grew, um, we could not allow anybody to say anything about anybody else because that was, you know, uh, that, uh, that triggered collusion. There were questions about why is this other seller. I mean, a bunch of sellers can get together and put down one seller and all that stuff. So it cannot, I mean, it doesn't work really well. So we created a feedback system which basically said, okay, you, when you buy an item from somebody, you can leave a feedback for that person and that person can, you can leave a feedback on you. So there are only two feedbacks that happen with every transaction, which is the person buying and, which is, and, and the other is which is the person selling the item. And nobody else gets involved in it. And it's a reasonably good approximation for um, uh, trust on the site, trust interpretation on the site. Um, the, the, the challenge there is that most of the feedbacks tend to be positive, right? I mean, so, so our feedbacks have this Pollyanna effect where, um, you know, you, you paid for it, you got mostly what you wanted to get for it, and um, uh, you should be happy, right? So you should leave positive feedback. Now, the, there's also an implicit effect there. It's like, if I, if I, if I want to leave a negative feedback for you, um, um, then who goes first, right? If I leave a negative feedback for you, what's the chance that you might leave a positive feedback for me? Very unlikely. So there is this negotiation that sometimes happens offline where somebody says, hey, leave me a positive feedback, um, and then I will leave, uh, leave you positive feedback. I mean, so people have studied uh, the, the feedback system. It's, a, it's, a, it's been a great topic for research um, um, in what, what feedbacks mean, what's, what's a, uh, um, a social nature of feedback when, when you say good things or not so good things about people. Um, in fact, recently, Chris De Rocas wrote a paper called The Sound of Silence. He says, what do, what do not leaving a feedback mean? What does not leaving a feedback mean? So when I don't leave a feedback for you, when I buy an item from you or when I sell an item to you, what does it mean, right? Um, am I happy or am I unhappy? And given that for the most of the site, um, you know, it is positive, it probably means that it's, and his conclusion is that probably I'm unhappy. Um, and my own personal experience, I, I think I would, I would say yes. When I don't leave, leave a feedback for somebody, I kind of say, yeah, you, you sold me what you said you're selling, but at the same time, you could have represented it better, right? So how do I, how do I get that fine-grained information um, uh, out? I just don't leave a feedback, right? And there are other things why you would only leave a feedback. Uh, if it's a cheap item, I'm buying a 99 cent CD, I don't really want to bother leaving feedback. Now, uh, power sellers or sellers who sell a lot um, have a system automated to leave feedback. So they will leave, I mean, and they don't care for feedback. If I have a feedback of 50,000 or 500,000, I don't really care if some small leaves me a feedback or not, right? Now, I might care if, I have an, if somebody leaves me a negative feedback. So negative feedback is kind of, is really, really, negative is really, really negative and neutral is kind of negative, and positive is uh, taken for granted, right? So when you have such an environment, I mean, that's, that's at, the, at, at the server, right? Um, how, do you, how do you manage trust interpretation is, is one of the things. Um, we also studied uh, some of the categories, especially stamps and antiques, and we were looking at the motifs on these uh, categories. And this was, this was, again, done by automatic mining. So I won't go into the details of how this was done. And we looked at how feedback impacts how people buy and sell. So feedback as an approximation for trust or reputation. So, um, um, and you can question that. We can take that offline. But let, uh, let's for now assume that these colors here indicate, um, uh, indicate reputation. Um, so the purple here means uh, the more you go towards the right, which is a purple color, means that the, 
uh, uh, higher the feedback or, or higher the reputation, the more uh, uh, go to the left, lower the reputation. Now, when I say lower, it does not mean negative. It just means that I don't have enough. I don't, I, you are not reputed enough. So everybody starts, let's say, at ground zero, right? Now, if you look at these categories, how things get bought and sold, um, you see interesting things. You, um, for example, um, if you look at the antiques category, look at the bottom left picture over there. Um, um, so the arrow going towards uh, towards a node means that it's, it's a purchase. So if you look at the bottom left node there, it's a, somebody with a, with a very high reputation uh, selling to uh, people with low and medium reputation. But at the same time, somebody with a medium reputation selling to somebody really with a high reputation. So how does that work? Um, so I have a theory behind it. I'm not sure if, if that is that is true. Um, um, people who collect, uh, for example, I, I've studied some, some other groups like the first edition um, books category. So if you have a first edition book, right, and you, you tend to collect a lot here, let's say you have medium reputation, um, and you know the value of the book, kind of. And so if you want to sell a first edition book, you might actually, the person who knows the value of it more than you might buy it for a pr price at which you think you got a good price. And, and they tend, tend, tend to market it better and sell it for two times, three times the price. Um, and sell it to people who are new to the site because the people who are new to the site, new, new to the category, or new to the domain, believe these guys over you, right? So the fact that you don't have a high reputation means that you can only. I mean, so implicitly it says that the price you command might be uh, might have a correlation with the um, um, uh, with your, with your reputation on the system, right? So, <clears throat> uh, so. Uh, yeah, basically the, the person is using the reputation to command a higher price in some sense. And that, that's kind of the nature of this. And I can explain all of these pictures, but I will, I'll kind of move on because I've got other stuff to show. And this was an, another, uh, another, uh, another thing that showed the nature of these things. Again, you can't probably see the scales very well. But the, uh, what you want to look for here is, is kind of the um, hot spot uh, of these, uh, some of these uh, domains. So if you look at the left there, arts and crafts and collectibles, um, um, well, how do typical transactions happen in these things? How do, how do, uh, who comes together when transactions happen on this side? So if you look at the bottom left, you see that um, if, again, using feedback as an approximation for reputation, uh, you need to be reasonably reputed to actually um, manage to uh, buy and sell on this, in these categories. Whereas if you look at collectibles, it is slightly lower. But if you look at the top picture, um, the, uh, the barrier to entry is really, really low. You don't have to be really reputed to to uh, transact on the site. So there is something for everybody on the site. But at the same time, when you go to specific domain, specific categories, reputation plays a big role in how, um, how, how sticky you are. Now, there, this is also weighted by the price. So you might be a low-reputed person, but you may not command a, high, uh, command a high price, which basically pushes you into the blue or the yellow region. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I was going to talk about reputation propagation, but I will, I will skip that for now. But one thing I do want to mention related to that is um, uh, why, why feedback is not, um, uh, not a complete um, uh, representation of reputation. So I've got two users here. So let, let's look at number six and number 26, right? So number six is uh, selling to um, uh, or transacting with all of these people who are kind of, you know, uh, let, let's, let, let's look at this diagram and say that the more connected you are, the more reputed you are. And the less connected you are, the less reputed you are. So if you look at the feedback score for, score for say, number 20, 26 and 20, and, and number six over there, the feedback scores will be approximately the same because they've done the same number of transactions, and let's assume all of them are positive. But at the same time, you, if you look at the reputation scores for these two people based upon the formula that I did not describe, I'll, I'll just give a, uh, give a one-line summary of how the formula is computed, um, then 26 and 20 are more highly reputed than number six because the quality of the people they transacted with is, is, is much more. So how we compute this is basically we say, you know, there are good sellers and good buyers. And how do you compute good sellers and good buyers? Uh, good buyers are those who buy from good sellers, and good sellers are those from whom good buyers tend to buy, right? So it, this is kind of a uh, recursive equation. So you can, you can translate that to Google PageRank or something like that um, in the static environment. Uh, but this is, happens to be dynamic because the dynamics of the system is constantly changing with every transaction. So on the web, pages are static. The links between the pages are static, but uh, mostly static. But in an in a, in a, in a environment like this, everything is dynamic. So you might be highly reputed today, and your reputation might go down over a period of time. Or you might be a low reputation person today, and your reputation might go up as the time goes on. Right? So um, based on this, we created this what we call the circle of trust. And this basically helps us uh, understand um, uh, 
understand the trust problem on the side. And we, we were looking at some of the users here. Uh, hopefully none of these users are in this room. But um, you know, how, and how well they are connected. And these are color coded based upon the trust they have. Uh, uh, so let's, let's uh, look at this and say, I think uh, red is the highest trust and blue is, uh, sorry, blue is the highest trust and uh, blue is the highest reputation and red is the lowest reputation. And you can look at this person, and, and these, are all, these are people with about the same number of feedbacks, uh, about the same feedback score. But at the same time, you, you look at the, the trust structures, it's significantly different. So uh, if I were to just look at this picture and say, hey, who is more reputed than um, um, uh, other, then I would say this person on the top left is more reputed um, than the person on the bottom right, even though they have the same, same feedback score. Okay. So, and we use this to actually create um, uh, 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 what kind of trust structures exist to, to look at how people common, constantly transact with each other and what, kind of, what, what drives these transactions to look at uh, topics that over which the transactions happen. And actually, something surprising hap uh, we found. I'm not sure how clear this is. We found out that people have circles of trust or circles of um, um, uh, um, s s s uh, stickiness around themselves around certain topics. So we went and mined these communities automatically, and we said, well, how do these communities exist? And some of the communities turned out to be not the categories that we have, not the domains that we constructed by hand, but they were just themes that people were actually trading on. So some of these things were things like Franklin Mint Coin or um, Longerberger Bags or, um, um, uh, or Star Trek memorabilia. And we don't really have appropriate categories for these things, but we noted that these people tend to hang out together. So we said, well, wouldn't it be great if we actually took, took this information and uh, created a social network um, um, site which is spe very specific to that topic. So it is powered by eBay on the back, but at the same time on the front, it is an environment where people who are junkies of these particular topics or are very passionate about this topic come and hang out together. So uh, the site just got launched, I think a couple of days ago, it's called neighborhoods.ebay.com, which is based upon this analysis that we did. And it, it, you can join any neighborhood, and, and, and in that neighborhood, you go and list and buy and sell items related to that topic and talk about people and actually have a reputation mechanism within that. Okay, so uh, this is a, a previous mock-up that we've done in the research class, but it is online no, no on site, um, so you can go and check it out. So um, in the end, basically, I just want to say one thing. You know, we, we, we talked about two things, which is you know, reputation and circles of trust. And uh, I think that's one way of looking at it. When people come together uh, constantly to transact with each other and build, build these circles, uh, you can call the circles of trust from one angle, from the social aspect. But on the other hand, the exact same information can be looked at uh, as spam and collision rings and fraud, collision and fraud rings. And we look for the same structures within the site, but they mean two different things to two different people. And we constantly struggle or juggle with this problem as to say, hey, okay, is, is, it, is, it, is it a great way to, uh, I mean, is it something that helps us create a better site by putting who are, uh, people who are connected very well together to provide them better tools to be connected? Or oh, because these people are connected, they're actually, it's actually it's a fraud ring. And so do we bust this thing? So this is, this is one of our biggest challenges. And what we've started doing is that using the community to help us with some of these things. And um, at least for us, we're saying, well, you know, the computers can't do everything for us. So uh, it's a community that's going to actually make the computers look good for us. And so that's the, the, the flavor of things um, that we're going to follow in eBay. And we've been following the research lab. Okay. That I'm going to stop. I'm not sure if we have quest time for questions. Repeat that. The proposition of eBay erode as you make the market so locally that people are trading with each other in the neighborhood. So pretty much in the neighborhood, they know who the other party is. So the trust is there, the verification is there, and transactions can happen so closely. Doesn't that get away from the whole value proposition? 
No, I, th I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a diff it's different. Right? It's apples and oranges. I mean, there's always a site where you can come and go do and uh, search for things and buy them and so on and so forth. But then there's this other thing where actually it already exists on the site. So I was, uh, um, I had uh, uh, the uh, chief editor of the Oxford English Dictionary. She uh, happens to be an active uh, participant in the arts and craft uh, category, and she said, "Yeah, absolutely. You know, we know each other." We don't know each other by face, we don't know each other by name, but we know each other by our, um, our symbolic names, and so we trust each other. And so that's our circle. And if you guys provide us a great tool to do that, and I'm not going to buy, go and buy or sell to somebody who is, who is not a part of that structure. So that's only one way of you know, allowing people to participate in a way they're already participating in very implicit ways. But at the same time, it doesn't, again, it, it, it's not a size that fits all, right? It's, it's for, it's, it, it works well for some and not for others. Yeah. So if you go to, for example, electronics category, there isn't much of, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of an Amazon, right? You go buy your stuff and you walk away. So the nature of those networks are very, very different. So only for the networks that are tightly knit, some of these might make sense. So no, nothing is manually done. So it, it, that's all centered. Right. That, that, that's all centered. The, the, the thing is that, I mean, there's this cold start problem. But at the same time, there is enough information in the system that actually tells you what the attributes are and what the values are. And if you're wrong, the sellers always correct you, right? I mean, or, or tend to correct. I mean, you can trust that. But um, you know, sellers will say something different, right? And you can use it for whatever it is worth. Uh, so there is, there is an offline mining system which actually does that. So you look at the data, and then um, um, we can talk about it offline. It's kind of a uh, little bit detailed. Yeah. So, and again, it is, it is not, we're not 100% we're not sure, right? We're only so much sure. So we're going to show it, and if it get, doesn't get adopted, it's going to get thrown away. Right? Okay. okay. Thank you. So Thank much. you. Thank you.